Thank you for the introduction, Robin, and thank you everyone for uh, being patient with my presentation. Today I will be presenting my joint work with Tan Zhang, uh, Victor Bao, Kyle Jamieson, and Suman Banerjee on video surveillance systems uh, built over wireless networks. Cameras are pervasive, from the smartphone cameras that you carry in your pocket to the surveillance cameras that are installed just about everywhere. In fact, recent surveys indicate that in Britain, there's one surveillance camera per 11 people. Cities like London and Beijing have one million cameras deployed, and New York City is looking to expand its network so that it can respond to security threats. The reasons that surveillance cameras are so useful is that they can be used for applications ranging from detecting intruders on campuses, analyzing customers in stores, to monitoring traffic on cities and freeways. So that's quite a few applications, both indoors and outdoors. More recently, we are observing a trend where we have a lot of wireless surveillance cameras coming into the market. The more prominent one that you've probably heard of is Dropcam. But all the other major surveillance camera companies are offering uh, surveillance cameras as well in the wireless domain. That would be Foscam or Aviglo. We believe this trend is because of the fact that wireless cameras are easy to install. You do not have to draw a wired connectivity all the way up to the camera, so you can install the camera just about anywhere and get the scene of interest that you're trying to monitor. This motivated us to ask the question, how do we build a large-scale uh, wireless video surveillance network? Well, the key challenge comes from the fact that wireless is a shared medium in scarce spectrum. If you look at a wireless access point today, and you wanted to get 20 megabits per second, consider indoor scenario, you would get a wireless coverage area of about 10,000 square feet, and 20 megabits per second would support 20 cameras uploading 1 megabits per second camera streams. But to cover the same area completely with cameras, you need more than one camera, and cameras have a range because they lose uh, they lose uh, pixels. Uh, you don't get enough pixels or resolution after a certain point. So you need multiple such camera clusters to completely cover this wireless coverage area. So for complete surveillance coverage, you need about 400 cameras at 10 feet resolution of installing such cameras. What, what this means is that you have a shortfall in terms of the number of cameras that can support the same wireless coverage area, from 20 cameras to 400 cameras. So video cameras can quickly overwhelm the wireless capacity. This motivated us to build Vigil, a wireless video surveillance system, where we set the following goals. We set the goal of, of course, maximizing the surveillance application accuracy and minimizing the wireless capacity usage. We will achieve these goals using three techniques uh, in the system. We use edge computing, we suppress redundancy, and we uh, do content-aware traffic scheduling. So let me go through these techniques uh, one by one. Let's first consider edge computing. Let's consider an example application where we want to find a person of interest by face. We analyzed about 250 hours of video feed in busy office halls around our campus, and uh, we have a sample video feed on the right, which I hope was playing here. Oops, sorry. Hey, please go back. OK. So the video is not playing uh, because it's up on the system. But what it was showing was that there are persons moving in this video. And uh, what we found in analyzing these 250 hours of video feed was that less than 20% of the feed had any people. 80% of the feed has no people. This gave us the intuition that useful video content is very sparse in surveillance videos. We use this intuition in building our system. So now uh, our system will have something called as an edge computing node. What that means is that at each camera, you're connect connecting a computing unit, a storage unit, and then there's a wireless access point. This will detect uh, queried objects that we are interested in at the camera based on the compute power that you have, and it will talk to a controller over wireless access networks. Let's look into this architecture in a little bit more detail. So 
the system will be triggered by a user-generated query that will go to the controller, and this query will be propagated to each of the cameras. Once the cameras get the queries, they're constantly analyzing their frames. They send the information of frame ID and corresponding person count in this case for the example that I considered in last slide. Uh, they send this information to the controller. The controller uses this information, as I will describe uh, later in the presentation, and um, will tell the corresponding camera if it has relevant video content to upload or not upload. So the lower cameras do not get to upload, while the camera on the right side gets to upload. And then the relevant video frames get uploaded. The key idea being that visual system only uploads the relevant frames, thus cutting down any frames that do not have relevant video content uh, corresponding to the user-generated query. So that's the first idea of edge computing. The second idea of redundancy suppression uh, also helps us achieve the same goal, and I'll describe it in detail now. Let's look at how video codecs work today. So video codecs compress frames across time. For example, they do uh, suppress motion. If you look at this figure, what you find is there are three subsequent frames, and there's a person and a home. The person moves closer to the home in the second and third frame, but there's only additional information corresponding to the first frame is coming from the fact that uh, the person has moved closer. So there is no need to transmit the entire image because the, you can just uh, transmit the relative Im uh, encoded image. So they use this concept of difference coding. This motivates us to ask the question, how can we compress frames from multiple cameras? Well, if we have cameras looking at the same area, they're probably capturing redundant video streams. And if you are uploading them uh, to the cloud, then we are basically uploading redundant information. So we use the concept of cameras uh, looking at the same area. We call them a camera cluster. In this example, we consider the example of a bus stop where we have people waiting, and we want to detect the congestion on the bus stop. We have one camera pointed towards um, people who are going to board the bus, and one camera pointed towards people who are going to leave the bus. And we ask ourselves the questions, how can we suppress the images uh, that are redundant and not upload both the video streams from both these cameras uh, to the cloud? But that generalizes across if you have multiple cameras in a cluster. Here we introduce the redundancy suppression algorithm. And I will explain it with a toy example. So the cameras are detecting the queried objects. Um, in this case, that will be the people that are on the bus stop. So camera two is detecting three faces because uh, these people are pointing towards camera two because they are leaving. And camera one is detecting zero objects because none of the faces are pointed in that direction. So each camera determines this frame utility, which is, in this case, the number of queried objects in the frame. Now notice that camera two has higher utility. It is detecting three faces. So camera one's video stream is not very useful. So it makes sense to select frames from camera two. Now consider a different example. So what changed? Uh, this time, the people are boarding the bus. So they're pointing towards camera one. So suddenly, the frame utility for camera one is higher and for camera two is lower. So in this case, it makes sense to select frames from camera one. Now what about a more generic scenario? Here we have some people uh, who are detected in camera one, and only part of those uh, group is detected in camera two. So the red, red, uh, red uh, squares detect, are detected in camera one, and the blue squares are only detected in camera two. So here you have a frame utility for camera one is three, and for camera two is two. Now that's not good, right? Because even though we know camera one has higher utility, we have no notion of whether we should upload both the video streams or not. So here we actually re-identify the objects from camera two and check if they are the same as camera one to see if we should upload both the video streams or not. How do we do this? Uh, so we employ a geometric approach, and I will explain the geometric approach, but there is no coordination among the cameras. Remember, there's only one central controller. So let me first explain the basic idea of re-identification. We will check if the pixels uh, map to the same physical location. 
So this is the second phase. The second phase um, in our example corresponds to pixels, uh, the blue pixels on the frame captured by second camera. It also corresponds to the red colored pixels on the frame captured by first camera. Now, if you are detecting a person in those red pixels and those corresponding blue pixels, then it's probably the same person because you know the relative camera locations. So the controller gets this information along with the information on the location of where it detected the faces, and, and that's what it uses to detect if these is the same person or not. So it's, it's the, the cameras themselves are not coordinating. Now, once we have determined that camera two has detected the same objects as camera one, so they're redundant, we decide that, okay, we will upload frames from camera one at this point. But at this point, which frames are we uploading? Should we upload each of these frames? So here we make a decision. We will um, do compression similar to what I explained as done in, in today's video codex, but we will use our frame utility value. So we will upload only the change frames. Let me explain what I mean by that. So we have, uh, we have a frame coming in, and then there will be the next frame, and there will be a certain frame utility that we will determine. So consider we have a sequence of frames. We have the first frame. We have Victor there. Um, and the frame utility is the number of faces detected. So we detected one face. So we upload the first frame, of course. And the second frame, since we still have the same image, uh, so frame utility stays the same. So we do not upload this. Now, Mario joins uh, in the third frame. So we have two faces detected. So we upload this image. And in the next frame, the frame utility stays the same. So we do not need to upload it. In the third image, Suman joins the uh, frame. So now we have three frame utilities. So we upload this frame. But you get the idea that we are basically uploading only the change frames. And that's, same as, uh, that's similar to what video codecs do, but we are using it uh, with respect to our application here. So now that we understand how redundancy suppression works and how it can give us intelligent way to select frames um, that we must upload to uh, when our wireless capacity is limited, let's see uh, the results or the evaluation of this uh, algorithm. So we will consider a single cluster of three cameras and we collected video traces uh, on our campus uh, where we had uh, different activity levels of people. When I say activity levels, what that means is that are people are coming in and out of the video traces, and uh, that corresponds to certain uh, number of change frames. So if I have enough bandwidth to upload certain change frames, that decides my, my activity level. On the x-axis, I plot the wireless capacity in kilobits per second. Uh, that's the available wireless capacity for each cluster. And on the y-axis, I plot the accuracy. Note that 100% accuracy would mean that I upload all the change frames, uh, which means I, I got basically all the information that I needed to upload. So I will start with 50 kilobits per second. You might say that, oh, that's a very small number. But remember, I wanted to support a lot of cameras. So at 50 kilobits per second, I find that Vigil, which is our system, which intelligently selects which frames to upload and which cameras to upload from, gets almost 1.7 times the accuracy of a system which just goes round robin and, 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 and lets each camera upload the frame that comes next. Now, if I go to higher bandwidths in this medium activity level, say 100 kilobits per second, 200 kilobits per second, 300 kilobits per second, notice that visual and, and without visual, you're not seeing much difference in accuracy. So you might tell me, oh, so, so your system is not giving much gains, right? But that's not true. What's really happening is that at this point, your wireless capacity is not saturated. You have all the bandwidth to upload all your change frames, but we are still getting the gains from choosing um, the change frames. So that's your edge computing gains are still there. So at 300 kilobits per second or 200 kilobits per second, you're already at 90% accuracy. And you're basically not uploading the entire one megabits video stream that you would have uploaded otherwise. Now let's consider a high activity level scenario where um, a lot of people are coming in and out. And I can give you precise numbers on what I mean there. But um, now here you will find that wireless capacity stays saturated and I don't have enough bandwidth to upload all my change frames. So in this case, um, at 50 kilobits per second, I get about 1.7 times accuracy gain again with Vigil. And the gain 
stays and, and increases as I go from 50 kilobits per second to 100 kilobits per second to 200 kilobits per second to 300 kilobits per second. But the key value here is coming from redundancy suppression because I'm intelligently choosing which frames to upload and which cameras to upload from in the cluster of three cameras. So now that we understand that we have a value to be had when virus capacity is saturated, we have a we basically um, get the value of redundancy suppression uh, when the wireless capacity is limited and you, have, you want to suppress any redundant images from camera clusters. A third technique that we uh, discuss in the paper, and I will not go into details, basically leverages the work in content-aware traffic scheduling to prioritize which camera cluster to uh, upload from uh, based on whether the objects that it's capturing are relevant to the user's query. I encourage you to read the paper or ask me questions uh, later on this, but I will not go in detail. So what value uh, that we get in building this system, especially outdoors, was that since we have all these uh, wireless nodes connected to the cameras that are deployed all over the place, we can use the bandwidth savings to actually provide Wi-Fi access and actually recoup the cost of building the surveillance network. So I put more cameras all over the place, but now I can actually use it to send, and upload, and download Wi-Fi traffic. So let me give you a quick snapshot of our system deployment. So we did pilot, uh, uh, pilot deployment uh, in white spaces at Microsoft Research last summer uh, and, and winter, and then in University of Wisconsin, and then over Wi-Fi networks in UCL. Here I have snapshots of the hardware that we used and some snapshots of our base station as well as the outdoor deployments. I also have a video which I hope will play. Uh, oh, this one actually plays. So this is a deployment of the, the system that we had at the bus stop where it's aggregating images from multiple cameras at the uh, cluster, a cluster of cameras at the bus stop. So before concluding, let me give a quick snapshot of the related work. So the notion of cloudlets or edge computing was first studied in, in, in IEEE pervasive computing uh, and has been uh, since then explored for dynamic offloading of mobile apps. But we use this concept for the first time for uh, building a wireless video surveillance system. The cloud-based uh, video surveillance systems have been studied before, uh, but mostly in the wired context. A uh, good example being IBM smart surveillance system. Uh, in the wireless scenario, we're just seeing Dropcam um, in the market, and what we have found in our experiments is that Dropcam ships uh, all the video to the cloud with or without motion detection. Also, uh, there are several advances in the realm of video compression, uh, such as uh, MPEG, uh, such as H.265, and so on, and we are able to leverage those uh, to actually get further gains in our system. And then there are a lot of advances in our vision analysis, analytic algorithms on mobile platforms itself, and we actually leverage some of these to add more, uh, more functionality to our edge computing devices. So let me go to conclusions. So we, we built the system uh, with the hope of uh, building a large-scale video surveillance network, and what we found was that we have this um, challenge in, in wireless that we have to overcome about bandwidth. So we use these three techniques where we got some really nice uh, gains, but the experience in building the system really taught us that um, the video content was really sparse, so, so you could get a lot of reduction by just choosing which frames to upload. When you have a scene to cover, it helps to have redundant views, so, so camera clusters really help, but you don't need to upload images from all the cameras, and then you can prioritize camera clusters based on uh, which camera cluster is really relevant to your user query. Thank you.